Foundation at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. Give you a little bit of information about these two accomplished women. Um, Judy Smith is a native of Colorado. Um, she co-founded the Axis Dance Company in Oakland, California in 1987. And that at the time was one of the first contemporary dance companies in the world to create and present dance that featured dancers with physical disabilities who used wheelchairs, prosthetics, and crutches, performing alongside non-disabled dancers and people with traditional capacities. In 1997, here in Boston, she was a co-curator and artistic consultant to Jeremy Alliger for Dance Umbrella's first international festival of wheelchair dance. Since 2008, she's been working with California State University East Bay to develop a first ever degree program in physically integrated dance in the US. And among her many awards are a Isadora Duncan Dance Award, the highest award they give on the West Coast to dancers, for sustained achievement. Dr. Sherry Blauett grew up in Iowa and attended Stanford University School of Medicine. She's a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the Brigham and Women's and is an instructor at the Harvard Medical School. She's competed at the Olympic and Paralympic level in events ranging from the 100 meters to the marathon. Uh, Sherry went on to win the New York Marathon twice, the Boston Marathon twice, and the Los Angeles Marathon four times. Um, we don't think she's a glutton for punishment, <laughs> but um, she did do that, all of those things. So we thought it would be a great opportunity um, to think about the similarities and differences between these two paths, um, these two ways of being physical um, people in the world. And I wanted to start with a kind of open question about hearing the story about um, what each of their beginning was as an athlete and as a dancer. So. So first off, thank you for the invitation to be here this afternoon. Um, this is a really, really cool event, and uh, I really enjoyed hearing more about the discussions this morning and how you know everyone's been able to build networks and community around integrated dance. Um, so my introduction to sport was a little bit uh, circuitous, you could say. Um, having grown up in the Midwest uh, in a rural community, there weren't a lot of other athletes or even people with disabilities, visible disabilities around. Um, and I didn't have a lot of role models growing up in that regard. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I really just had a lucky encounter um, in which our high school track coach discovered that the state of Iowa had a wheelchair racing event at their state track meet for both high school um, boys and high school girls. And um, he was just a great guy. And he said, you know, Sherry, I've heard about this event, and, and I think that you should give it a try. And at that time, I totally blew him off because, because <laughs> I did not consider myself an athlete. I had never been a part of our school's you know, varsity sports program or interscholastic sports program. And because of that, I had gotten involved in lots of other things, like music and student council and you know, other activities. And I always just thought, I assumed that sports weren't for me. And in hindsight, I think I assumed that simply because I, you know, I was sort of self-selecting out of it mm -hmm. because I you know, inherently knew there weren't any opportunities. So um, it took a lot of coaxing, but in my freshman year of high school, I went out for the team. And initially, um, I was of course the only athlete with a disability, but, um, but uh, stayed a part of the community. They had a couple of exhibition wheelchair racing events at the local state, at the local track meets, and then at the end of that season, went to the state track meet, and that was really a breakthrough moment um, because at that meet, I learned that there was a junior wheelchair racing program that was going on in Des Moines, Iowa, um, and I learned that there were other adolescents mm -hmm. who were participating, and I learned that there was a coach that had specialty knowledge, and that was really the first hook that got me involved and with sustained involvement in the sport because suddenly you know, more than anything, I latched onto the community and um, latched onto the fact that there were other teenage girls who also had disabilities that I could just be a part of their world and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, so that was really the initial involvement, and then and then from there, just kept training, and you know, the rest is the more basic stuff. Just kept training and getting a little better and a little better over time, until um, until 
I had the epiphany that I could be good at it and compete nationally and then internationally. So it was one key person who really opened the door. Yeah, right. Can you just add to that? Okay. Great. And can you hear me on this? Um, well, I was always athletic as a kid. I grew up riding jumping horses, and that's pretty much what I thought I was going to do with my life. And I was injured when I was 17 in a car accident. And, you know, I, I basically felt my life was over. And through some kind of circuitous routes, I ended up in Berkeley, California, from Woodland Park, Colorado, and uh, where I think I was the only visibly physically disabled person in the county at the time. And we had boardwalk sidewalks, so um, not the most accessible place. I ended up in Boulder and then, and then Berkeley. And, um, you know, I, I really, um, having been so athletic and then becoming so disabled, um, it was just pretty alienated from my body. And I met a woman and I started doing improvisational movement. And that really changed my life. And from improvisational movement, I got into um, conditioning and swimming and was really encouraged to go into competitive swimming. But you know, having been a competitive equestrian, I, I really didn't want to go that route again. I got into martial arts from that and met our uh, Axis Dance Company's first artistic director, Thais Mazur. And she asked me if I wanted to be in a dance piece, and I had no dance background mm -hmm. whatsoever. But I was really, really interested in movement and really interested in what I could do physically again. And I said yes, and um, this was in 1987. And we, uh, she really got us together with the idea of doing one dance piece. But I think what happened for us, we were going to perform a, a piece in the Dance Brigade's Furious Feet Festival for Social Change <laughs> and in 98. And um, those of us that were in the first piece, just got hooked on what we were doing. We loved it. You know, we didn't know anyone else around the world was doing this. It was before the internet. You know, so it, it was just hard to know what was kind of going on other than we knew it was happening in contact improvisation. Um, but we got hooked and we did our first dance piece and the dance community got hooked and the disability community got hooked and we just kept getting offers to create work. And before we knew it, it's kind of taken over our lives. And, um, you know, 29 years later, it's kind of become my life's work. And, um, yeah, so it's not, it's probably the last thing I ever thought I would be doing with my life. I'd like to hear about how each of you got training. Um, you were talking a little bit at the beginning about how you were mm -hmm. inspired to participate, but that's there's a big gap between beginning mm -hmm. and developing to be the elite athlete that you, you have become. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Sure. So um, initially my training was a little bit uh, piecemeal. <laughs> I kind of patched it together, I would say. Um, so in my younger phases of, of competing, I <laughs> did train with our high school track team, and that was really almost, a par almost I got to say, probably almost more symbolic than anything. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the coaches and folks in school felt like it was important for me to be a part mm -hmm. of it and for, for that inclusion to occur because they were great people who, I mean, this was in the mid-90s, they were great people who had a great um, sense of the importance of it. Um, uh, and then I would go on weekends to train with this team in Des Moines, which was about a four-hour drive one way. So we had to, we had to travel to train. Mm -hmm. um, that changed when I went to um, undergrad and then beyond. So I went to undergrad at the University of Arizona, and at that time, it was one of only two colleges that had wheelchair racing programs as part of their, um, you know, university infrastructure. And it wasn't it wasn't through varsity sports or through the NCAA. It was actually more through like disability student services, but at least it was there. Um, yeah. And uh, and that's actually still how it exists. That's people are working to change that because it should be part of sports rather than part of disability student services. But, um, but, but once there, then I got better quickly and had a lot much better training opportunities because I had a coach that I was able to work with almost daily and teammates and all my teammates were initially a little better than me so I had people to look up to and to train mm -hmm. up to. Um, and then, and then um, that's when I participated in my first Paralympic Games and then, and then when I went to Stanford, I was a little bit more independent. By then, thankfully, I um, knew my own training program pretty well, and I just hired my own coach and worked independently with him because mm -hmm. there wasn't a, a team in, in the region 
Um, there were programs for young athletes like four, but no, um, no specific programs for higher level athletes at that time. So, so I trained with cyclists and I had friends who were triathletes and I'd integrate into their trainings and kind of made it happen. Um, so it changed along the way and it was definitely a, a proactive endeavor of having to seek it out, I would say. <laughs> yeah, well I think, you know, for me it was really on the, on the job training. I, I literally had two left wheels. I knew nothing about dance, but you know, we worked a lot together and um, <coughs> you know, uh, and also the non-disabled dancers had in the company, you know, had never worked with people who used wheelchairs and and so it was kind of learning both ways. Um, but what Axis realized really early on was that, you know, there are not opportunities, there weren't opportunities for disabled dancers to get training 29 years ago, and there still aren't very many opportunities now. But what we did was we started an education program, which has grown up right alongside our artistic program. Um, but, you know, the other thing I did was that I really wanted to know about dance not only about my own dance, but I wanted to know about the dance world. So I just started going out and seeing everything I could possibly see. And uh, this was probably um, fortuitous because I ended up kind of running the company and, you know, art artistic director and executive director and, you know, that, you know, antlers for the hat. But what I did was I educated myself about who were the presenters locally who are the choreographers, who are the dancers, who are the funders, who are the donors. And then I started doing that nationally. I read everything that I could read, you know, and you know, the training that I could get um, was minimal. Um, we did bring a few people into the company. Um, in 97, the company imploded. And uh, selfishly, I really wanted to, one, do better art, and I wanted to be able to work with other people. I wanted more knowledge. So we started bringing choreographers in and commissioning choreographers to make work on us. And I think that, was, that has probably been, for me, kind of the biggest source of education is, you know, being able to work with 12 or 15 different choreographers and, you know, bringing people in to teach master classes and, um, you know, just learning from, learning on the job. Um, and what I'm trying to do now, we just, uh, AXIS just hosted a national convening on uh, physically integrated dance in New York. And one of the things that we were really looking at is this whole issue of um, training for disabled dancers, training for choreographers. Um, and this is something that now I wanna start devoting a little bit more time because I don't want people coming into this field, you know, be they younger, having been disabled from an early age or acquiring a disability, you know, later in life. Um, I, I want them to have opportunities if they want to pursue dance. And I want disabled kids to know that dance is out there mm -hmm. and that it's a possibility. And a lot of the, the disabled kids now, um, they don't know that, you know, and they don't know what's possible. And we started our kids program precisely because a mother called me for a year and a half and said, when are you going to do a kids program? When are you, you know, and we started a kids program and then we had to turn it into a teens program. And, mm -hmm. you know, then we realized, well, you know, we really need to, we, we need to have a, pre be a pre-professional training ground. So we started a summer intensive, you know, so um, I, I don't want, I don't want people to have the same kind of barriers that I had when they really have a passion and really want to do something. And, just don't have the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, we've talked about a lot is this notion of expectations and self-fulfilling prophecies. The notion that if people don't expect anything of you, maybe you won't try. Mm -hmm. um, if people expect too much of you, you may give up. Um, and that whole question uh, as disabled uh, people in a community where what you are doing is not mainstream, though of course we want it to be ever more mainstream, how do you deal with that issue of both others' expectations for you and your expectations for yourself? Mm. Well, I think, mm. I think, um, I would say, I mean, I think I experienced that. I, I've experienced that, the importance of 
setting expectations at the right level, I think, at all different phases of my career. Um, and and I think early on, um, early on, I would say that that it was really important. Um, I often, when I was first starting to get involved in sports, particularly noticed that I would be interacting with other young people who. Um, Maybe I'd had different sets of expectations coming from folks at home. For example, their mm -hmm. parents is a big one, um, or coaches or teachers. And it became very apparent to me early on how important it was. Um, you know, I could, I'm sure you've experienced this too, Judy. I, I could be, you know, sitting next to someone with the totally equivalent disability, um, same age, really same mm -hmm. person, but the mindset of, you know, the expectations we had for ourselves, which was probably placed on us by folks at a young age were super important to what we assumed our goals and dreams and aspirations would be. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's tremendously important. Um, I think one of the most important next frontiers in terms of sports, um, uh, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about dance as well, is, is changing expectations, particularly in school-based settings. So um, I always say right now, most kids with disabilities um, have to opt in to play sports. So they have to seek it out. You know, it's not a part of their um, school's infrastructure to support them being athletes. Um, there's been a push to change that. So in 2013, the Department of Education um, published a, what they call a Dear Colleague letter, um, talking about the fact that interscholastic, interscholastic sports are also, um, are also a part of inclusive education. So just like we, we no longer segregate kids for for school uh, in terms of their classroom work, um, and every child is allowed the right to public education. Um, they basically they essentially said, by the way, that's also supposed to be applied to sports <laughs> and physical right. activity. Um, it's not just what you learn in the classroom or your academic work. Um, and so, so I think we're sort of like on this cusp of that being the next wave of what we need to do to change those expectations at a very young age. Um, and I think simply put, you know, most kids um, who do not have a disability um, kind of have to opt out of sports. Like, you know, you interface with it at multiple levels, whether it's, you know, pick up basketball as a teenager or little league or taking ballet mm -hmm. when you're <laughs> starting ballet lessons when you're three or what, whatever it may be. Um, you know, you're inter you interface with multiple opportunities along the way. So many that you actually have to purposefully not engage, you know. Whereas kids with disabilities, it's the opposite. You have to actually mm -hmm. seek them out. And the, the assumption, if you don't seek them out, is that you'll never be involved. So it has to kind of flip, in my opinion. And I think, I think schools are probably one of the most important, um, important venues for that change. And, and now we have legal backing to, to say that that's what we should be doing. Right. It just has to be implemented. Um, so I would say that's one of the more important things and one of the more most important frontiers. I know that that was very important for me. And I think a really important next step towards changing our expectations. Yeah. Um, and of course, the expectations we place on young people shape the expectations of adults too. So it all starts, it all starts at a young age. Yeah. I, I actually have to say that I really love um, that we're talking about dance and athletics mm -hmm. together because I, I have found in my attempts to infiltrate mm -hmm. um, disabled sports and you know tell them about dance that you know there's this kind of assumption that dance is frou-frou and you know it's not physical and it's you know it's it's fluff and it's not mm -hmm. it's really tough and it's tough on every level I mean when you're you know dancing at a, at a professional level um, you know it's you have to engage your emotions and your brain and your body and everything, you know, in the same way that you do with athletics. So I love, you know, being able to um, kind of share the, the platform. And I think especially um, because I, I think um, dance has a lot to offer athletics. Mm -hmm. And I know that athletics um, has brought a lot to this company. We've had a lot of disabled athletes come in who are kind of no, no longer really interested in competing or, you know, they, they find dance and they're like, oh, this is actually what I really want to do. For me, I mean, it, it was very different. I mean, my expectations, you know, when I was a, a young kid jumping big horses over jumping you know, over big fences was, you know, I wanted to win those blue ribbons. And I often rode 
uh, in classes with people that were better than me. And that's kind of how I learn, you know. Um, I think when we started this company, um, I didn't really have any expectations because I, I didn't know what I, I didn't know what it was. I didn't, you know, we just made it up as we went along. Um, but then when I started seeing what other companies were doing, you know, that weren't physically integrated in any way, but I saw the level of art that they were doing, then my expectations were that I wanted to be on the same stages as them. I wanted to get the same funding as they were getting. Um, I wanted to have critics reviewing us critically, you know, and not just, isn't that nice what they're doing? So um, that became my expectation, is how are we going to make access, you know, that kind of a company that's operating in, in the contemporary dance world at the same level as other repertory companies? And I, probably like Sherry, am a fairly driven person. Um, and, you know, uh, when I wasn't able to ride it, it was really hard for me to find a place to put that drive. And I think in trying to build access um, to the company that it is, you know, more than just my, my own self, um, that, that just gave me a, a, a place to put my, my drive. training, you were just talking about, you know, building the company, and um, we sometimes think about uh, even co competitive and team-based athletics as very individual mm -hmm. driven, mm -hmm. um, and the participation being very individual, but both of you seem to have a kind of much more communal sense of how your fields developed, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why a sense of community within athletics, within dance, is important to you and kind of how that moves you forward individually? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I think, I think along the way, um, particularly, particularly as I started to compete nationally and internationally, I think along the way, it, it, was, very, it was always very clear to me that what we were doing well, <coughs> something that was an individual passion, um, was far more than just a sports performance on the field of play. It was also a social movement, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. And um, right. and I think that most of the people, I, I found very few athletes that I competed alongside, um, whether I was their competitor or their teammate, I think there were very few that didn't feel the same way. And so I think all of us were there in a way. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you love, you love playing the sport, you love competing, you love winning. Otherwise, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't maybe, wouldn't be mm -hmm. there, wouldn't be competing for your national team or at the Paralympics. Um, so there's always that inherent sense of like healthy competitiveness, but, um, but you know, we all knew that, that, that we were in it together to try to change perceptions about, mm -hmm. about what we could do and about what the next generation could do. And that came in a lot of different ways, you know. Um, for example, in 2004, um, the, it, it used to be, it's actually not the case anymore, but it used to be that there was a, a wheelchair racing exhibition event at the Olympics. It was the 800 meter for women and the 1500 meter for men. And that actually started back at the, in, at the L, with the Los Angeles games in the 80s. And um, it had stayed in the games, this, this, uh, this one event uh, for many years. And um, by the time 2004 rolled around, which was when I was um, kind of at the peak of my career, you know, it, it, people were starting to kind of get this uncomfortable feeling about it because it was an honor to compete at both the Olympics and Paralympics. And if you were talented to, to um, qualify to compete in the Olympic exhibition, it meant that you were really one of, one of the best eight in the world at that event because they took eight, eight athletes. Um, but as the movements progressed mm -hmm. and, and as the Paralympic movement progressed, it, became to, it came to be more uncomfortable because all of us as athletes were starting to sense that this exhibition status or sort of showing up for the kind of little head patty type of feeling, you know, yeah. didn't feel good anymore, whereas it might have been a completely, conceived completely differently back in the 80s when they started it. Uh, but that was, that, that, that feeling was the result of the fact that the movement had moved so far forward and athletes had such a better sense of what their rights should be. And so mm -hmm. one, uh, one example is that um, for the U.S. team, so there were, there was myself and one guy and we both qualified for this Olympic exhibition, 
but we were essentially told we could come in for 48 hours, like come in, live in the, you know, be in the village one night, race to race and leave. And we said, well, you know, if we're coming to do this exhibition event and we're wearing this jersey that says USA, like shouldn't we be able to be there for the whole games or shouldn't we be able to march in opening ceremonies with the team? Um, and you know, the response was, well, it's not, it's not actually an Olympic event, it's a Paralympic exhibition event. And we're like, well, what's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> What's that? This is a very gray, mm -hmm. and it doesn't it doesn't feel right that that yeah. you know we're not being welcomed as part of the full U.S. contingent, mm -hmm. um, and and that level of discomfort not only from our standpoint but from athletes from other countries as well, actually kind of led to this the event it, the event fizzled out because athletes were essentially saying well if we're not going to be there in full then we don't want to be there then we'll prepare for our marquee event which is the Paralympic Games right. which occurs shortly after. And so it's that, and, but you know, we made that decision together as athletes, mm -hmm. and if we hadn't spoken up about it, I, nothing mm -hmm. would have changed. And so, so those types of moments happened a lot, that's one example, but we interfaced with those kinds of decisions frequently, even as athletes. And as a Paralympian, it, you, know, you know, your ability to stand up for yourself and, and make sure that the, um, the, the um, how to put it, the, the event you're going to, or the travel, or you know, the speaking that you're doing, making sure that it was um, on par with what you felt like you know you should be enabled to do as an athlete was really important, and that that created the social community. Okay. Although mm -hmm. training together was also really important, and all those nuts and bolts too as an athlete. Right. Well, I think being in a company, you know, uh, it's it it takes a company, and I, what I love about this form of dance is. Um, that I do feel like it has a message. And, you know, I didn't grow up in a, in a political family or an activist family, but, you know, I became disabled at a young age when we didn't have the ADA. And, you know, you become an activist and you become an advocate just for yourself. Um, and so what I do love about the work that Axis and other companies like us do is that I feel like there is a social relevancy to it. And I'm not sure I love art for art's sake, but personally, I don't think I would work this hard for art for art's sake because it, it's taken a lot, you know, to, to build this company and to do this work. So the fact that it does have a message and that, you know, it does change ideas about dance and about ability um, for me is really important. And, you know, the community part, you know, what I love about about physically integrated work is that when you bring dancers who are not disabled together with dancers who are, you know, we can do things that a company of all disabled dancers wouldn't be able to do and a company that all non-disabled dancers wouldn't be able to do. So it's really that, that kind of um, marriage of the two of them that makes the work possible. And, you know, when you're working that closely and that intimately with people, um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to learn to trust each other, not only on a, an emotional level, but also on a kinesthetic level, you know, and you get to know people so well, um, you know, and your bodies fit together well and, you know, all of that. So, <coughs> you know, and I mean, just having uh, for access, the community is everything. You know, it's, uh, it's our support system, it's our funding system, it's, you know, uh, our participants are our community, you know. So um, I, I love that about the work is, is that it really, it, it's, it takes a lot of people to make it happen. And it takes a lot of people to make it um, worthwhile, I think, you know. Before we open up to questions, I wanted to give each of you a chance to ask the other one a question. So um, I have watched over the years. Um, so I, I, my ears perked up when you had mentioned um, the the initial or maybe historic lack of receptivity between dance and mm -hmm. sports. Um, because I think I, uh, although I can't personally say that I personally would not have been receptive, I can understand how there may have initially been hesitancy, you know, in times past. So I would love to know: Have you do you see that changing at all? And if not, what can you do to make it better? Well, I think it, I think it is changing some, and I believe in, 
the Paralympics now, don't they have wheelchair dance sport? As mm -hmm. the yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think it, I think it, it's changing some, not as much as I would like it to, you know. Um, I think the fact that uh, dis disability sports, disabled sports are getting so much more coverage, not enough coverage, but uh, way more than it used to be, it's better. You know, and I think especially with all of, of course, the wars and you know, the veterans coming back and so many um, disabled veterans going into sports, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's really brought the visibility up. Um, but I, I, think, I think there's a lot of room and, and I still have to figure out those ways to infiltrate because um, I, you know, I, I think that uh, disability sports are kind of a, a, a good, um, w would be a great ally. Mm -hmm. you know, because when we, when we have, you know, it's often that, not often that we find a disabled dancer that comes with a lot of experience or a lot of training unless they were trained before they became disabled. Um, but a lot of the athletes that have come to us as dancers, you know, they, they have that, that self-discipline. Mm -hmm. They have the motivation to work hard. Um, they can train, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, those are all really good qualities in a dancer, mm -hmm. you know. So I would, l I would love to see a little bit more cross-pollination, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a logical next step for um, athletes who still want to do something physical and want a career, but maybe they're just not not competing anymore. Yeah, I know several. Oh, good. <laughs> well, who have um, made a great transition and love it. And yeah, and find it to be. So you get to ask Jerry questions. Gosh, um, <laughs> that's such. A, I I wish you had prepared me for this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, De Sherry and I first met at Stanford. Mm -hmm through Larry Zaroff, who was a nutty, yeah. nutty professor. Yeah. He was a doctor <laughs> who was very interested in how art heals. He always wore an Elmo cap. Yes. <laughs> he, was, he was lovely. And so I, I guess from uh, one question for me, for you, um, would be, you know, has art played any part in your life, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of shaping, you know, who you are or supporting your your sports or your medicine career? Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I would say it has. Um, so, like a lot of kids, well, I think um, I mentioned that before I got deeply involved in sports, before I really kind of claimed that identity as athlete, um, one of the things that I had latched onto and was really embracing was um, music. Oh, and so I um, was involved in, I, I was a piano player through a lot of high school and even through college actually and at one point in my life when before sports sort of took over my <laughs> life um, I thought I, I was I felt myself at a crossroads actually of whether or not I should pr pursue more you know I felt like I had to invest more so in one or the other mm -hmm. but music was actually really important to me and I think I think it was um, something like for a lot of young people something that that gave me initial discipline and confidence and and that sense of performance. So, you know, going to competitions and even recitals and competing at the high school level in um, for, for different opportunities, music I related to music, um, I think I think went part and parcel of sports. And, you know, there are a lot of great athlete musicians out there, athlete artists and people yeah. who have found that they are very mutually beneficial endeavors uh, for a lot of reasons. And I think I think that's that's why. Um, I think, you know, particularly when I got to higher levels of sport, you know, I always um, compared, particularly if you're going to something like the Paralympics, you know, you train for, it's just like, it's just like a big performance. You mm -hmm. train for years and uh, you have to control your own energy and nerves and, and um, control your own um, sort of internal environment to be ready to put it out there for the world. And I think that's, that's exactly the same thing that happens yeah. in, in the lives of artists, particularly successful artists. So I think they're, I think they're very, very similar in many ways. Yeah. And it certainly yeah. benefited me. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Um, so I want to just open it up for a couple of questions. And I'll repeat them, um, just make sure that we get them on the live stream. So, yes. It's your big chance. 
Yeah, Marianne. The, the question really is about the response of people who don't mm -hmm. necessarily understand the demands of wheelchair athletics and why you would be doing it, and that you have to feel that you have to keep explaining it over and over again. And uh, Marianne was saying that she's also been very interested in wheelchair dance and figure skating, and 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 those ideas being very fruitful to even consider. Um, much less put out in the world. Sure. So, um, I think I've seen I think I've seen cha things change over uh, maybe the last ten years or so. Um, but still, today there's certainly a lot of people who who um, don't necessarily have a great initial concept when you describe to them that you competed. You know, I uh, currently I always say I had a whole first chapter in life or a whole first profession really and that was being a professional athlete for many years and um, people don't really know what that means in the context of being a wheelchair user or being a professional athlete in the yeah. sport of wheelchair racing. Now there's a, there's a lot of exceptions to that. Um, like for example here in Boston people are very familiar with the marathon and, and because the marathon has such a huge cultural hook here people often have seen it and they've seen the wheelchair division come through and they know they, they they can visualize they that. It. They know they get it. They know what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very athletic, they can see the athleticism in that. And so right. it's an easier an easy, easier um, um, way to explain it. But I think um, particularly when I was competing, like through the through the late 90s, 2000s especially, um, and this was, was far before there was any coverage here in the U.S. of, of high-level um, disability sport, that people would initially assume that it was something that was recreational, something that mm -hmm. you did, um, you know, as a means of rehab and that sort of thing. Which, which, you know, that those opportunities exist and they're very important opportunities. Um, but the the important thing to understand and the really big big um, educational moment is just describing to folks that that spectrum mm -hmm. exists just as it does for anyone. You know, if you want to. Um, go out and do something very recreational just to be with your family and friends uh, versus, you know, doing something to re rehabilitate an injury versus competing internationally. And mm -hmm. the importance of that is that we have that spectrum and that people can access it wherever they are, wherever they want to access it. And so, so I, it's changed. People have a better sense now than they did 10 years ago, and I'm sure that was the same 10 years prior to that. So, so you know, the more we get it out into the community and out into the public, then the less explaining I have to do. And, um, and I would say that, that uh, there are certainly times when it gets frustrating, um, and I usually, <laughs> I usually, as with most advocacy issues, decide how much emotional energy to invest yeah. in it at any given point in time. And yeah. sometimes I just walk away or wheel away because <laughs> I don't necessarily feel like explaining it at this moment in time versus other moments it might, you have the energy to explain it and really, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, hopefully, you know, um, help the individual to get a better sense. Yeah. I have a couple of things to say about that because I think um, trying to explain the Paralympics when a lot of people have the idea that it's very special Olympics and then you get the, oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's, that's one thing that's hopefully changing is that there's, you know, yes, there's the very special Olympics and yes, these are professional or you know, amateurs uh, competing at the international level. They're two different things. 
I have had the experience of having somebody say, well, what do you do? And I say, I'm a dancer. And they say, oh, you can walk. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I can't walk. And they're, the, you know, the, the brain goes kind of blank, yeah. um, you know, because anybody can conjure up an idea about what, of what ballet is, mm -hmm. but very few people can conjure up an image of what somebody in a wheelchair or somebody without legs or somebody on crutches dancing might be. So um, we had an experience, uh, I think the first time we came to Boston, we were on a flight out of San Jose and the flight attendant asked us what we were doing and you know, we said, oh, we're going to perform at a dance festival in Boston and she laughed at us, <laughs> you know, ha 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 ha. And then we get off the plane and this was when people could meet you at the gate and our presenter, Jeremy, who happened to know the flight attendant, was waiting there for us and she got off the plane. She said, oh, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm picking up Axis Dance Company. And she was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, it, it's just, it's funny because people really, yeah. you know, you say you're a dancer and they're like, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sweet. Sure. For sure. So. Yeah, there's kind of like a special Olympic thing happens constantly. Yeah. 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 But I never want to. I don't want to discredit the special. No, Olympics. absolutely, it's a fantastic no. group, fantastic movement. No, they're That's doing wonderful things. Also incredibly important. It's so just not different. The same. Yeah. yeah, different, different goal. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it's it's just this idea that, you know, we still have such a in this society such a limited view of what people with disabilities mm -hmm. can do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One of the things that both. Um, Sherry and Judy really represent is this notion that there are in fact no limits mm -hmm. and that there are not limits to their abilities and that there are not limits to our abilities to see, appreciate, understand, learn, um, have exchanges um, with these uh, different issues and um, we're just so grateful that we've had this conversation I um, want to thank the folks at HowlRound for um, putting this on HowlRound TV so that people will be able to participate who are not here in this room. Um, and Boston Dance Alliance is very grateful to our lead sponsor, the Bar Foundation, for making this possible. Thanks so much. <laughs>